that Christian discipleship guy that says, hey, leave me a comment and I'll get back to you. And then you wait a week, a month, sometimes as much as six months, and he still hasn't gotten back to you. Well, we're fixing that today. Hey guys, and welcome back to God's Word Made Simple by Simple Servant Ministries. My name is Aaron Hawk, and if this is your first time visiting with us, I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today. God's Word Made Simple is an online discipleship ministry dedicated to taking God's Word and making it simple. We want to help you understand God's Word, apply it to your life, and grow in your relationship with the Lord. Also, if you appreciate this ministry and content, at some point make sure and hit that subscribe button, turn that bell notification to all so you don't miss any future videos. We would love to have you as part of our family. Hey guys, welcome back. I hope the intro at least made you laugh if you didn't just feel it in the feels. Um, but I'm going to be responding to comments from YouTube. Check out my most recent channel update that I believe went live last week. Check that out as far as why it took me this long to get back with you guys. Um, again, I apologize, but I cover that in that video, so check that one out. Today, I just want to go through the various comments, and uh, you know, I'm going to name the username for the most part. I'm going to name the username and what video it was on, and then do my best to respond to your comments as I referenced last week. And if you've been a subscriber here for a while, you'll, you'll understand. I tend to try to be thorough and as brief as I can, but also thorough, and take how long it takes me to talk things out and put that in writing. It would take me forever to get caught up. So I appreciate you guys for sticking with me, and I, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to talk out my response to you guys, and then I'll go back in the comments and put a link to this video once it goes live so that you know, hey, that guy isn't just a jerk. He, he just had stuff going on in life, and now he's given me a response. And hopefully this is even better than a typed out response. I know it will be more meaningful in terms of how I'm able to respond. So with that said, let's stop talking about it and actually get to it. So four months ago, uh, John Patterson, with some additional stuff, um, on a video, how to talk to your kids about Santa Claus. I, I have to chuckle at that one because uh, you're watching it four months ago about Santa Claus. So I think that's interesting. I don't know. Maybe you're thinking about it ahead of time, whatever. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure if this is a troll, a, a, like a little troll, or, or if this person's being serious. I'm not sure, but I'm going to treat it as if it's somebody that's kind of being serious, but it kind of comes across as also venting. Um, so how to talk to your uh, kids about Santa Claus. Uh, I think it was my most recent. I did two versions of that over the years. Um, we've, we're well over 600 videos now. Um, so they, the person responded to that question, should Christians believe or teach their kids about Santa Claus, they responded to that question. Yes, they should. Why do all you evangelicals want to take people's fun away? Uh, so the you there, obviously this is an accusation because um, you're distancing yourself in the way that you're saying that. Um, I'm not going to hate on you for the misspelling. Uh, or maybe that, I guess that was probably on purpose. I didn't catch that before. Evangelicals. Uh, so yeah, you're definitely trolling a little bit then if you're bothering to purposely... Uh, throw that in there, but if you're asking that question, you didn't fully watch the video. Possibly not at all if you're trolling. You didn't fully watch that video if you're asking that question, because I actually address that in that video. It has nothing to do with ruining fun. It has everything to do with a faith that is based on a God that, for the most part, we don't see audibly hear or physically interact with. And we're teaching our children that a Santa Claus that you don't see, hear, or interact with is real, and a Jesus who we don't see, hear, or interact with is real physically. Of course, we pray there's the spiritual side, but I'm talking in terms, I'm, I'm speaking now in terms of a skeptic, the way a skeptic would word these things you're teaching them about Jesus, you're teaching them about Santa, and then at some point in your life, you're like, ha ha, just kidding, I've been lying to you your entire life. In fact, I've been lying so much that I went above and beyond to provide presents and label them wrong and teach you wrong, and I even took you to the mall or wherever to go see this guy that's dressed up, and all of society has been lying to you. 
but Jesus is real, I promise. Um, so to John Patterson, um, I seriously doubt that you are a Christian if you're asking this question, especially asking it this way. But for the sake of logical consistency, put yourself in that position. Would you want to teach your child something that is false, that has similarities to something that you want your child to believe is real? Plus, the rules in Scripture have nothing to do with ruining fun. It has everything to do with growing in Christ and understanding what joy is. Fun is temporary. Joy is eternal. So anyway, that's my response to that one. Uh, again, I, I totally missed and, and I'm pretty confident you're trolling at this point. Also, I referenced earlier in the video, uh, we are going to deal with a major troll. I would say it's more like a mosquito that keeps popping up. We're going to deal with that later in the video. Um, so the next one came up on a video called Christianese. What do Christians mean by being called? If I think to, I'll put links to these videos in the description. We're not going to have enough cards. If not, leave me a comment and let me know that I failed in that. Um, but anyway, uh, Asa, Asa, Asa something, uh, Aldridge, I think. Uh, three months ago, Christianese, what do Christians mean by being called? And, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to say Asa. I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name. Um, Asa, I, I think you're correct. And I think we're saying the same thing. It was hard for me to know in that video, how hard do I hit this versus present the information and let people wrestle with it? And I struggle with that as every, I think every teacher struggles with that. How much do you just nail people with what you think is um, the best way to word it? Or here's what you should believe versus here's the information and here's why I believe this to be correct and then let people sort through it. Because if you just tell people information, they might remember it, they might not, they might accept it, they might not. But if people, if people... Uh, how do I word this? <laughs> I'm doing it right now. Uh, I'll just say it bluntly. If people think they came to the idea on their own, they're much more likely to retain it permanently. So I agree with you. Um, so I'll, your comment here, I think it's a little more loaded than that in terms of the I think or I feel that God is leading me in this way, that way, whatever. I actually completely agree with what you're saying. I, I understand and I appreciate your follow-up to this. Um, and I was hoping to spur some conversation in the comments. Um, but anyway, you said even adding the modifier I think or I feel doesn't change the fact that we can't prove whether you, in the generic sense, clearly in context, you mean that in terms of you people are BSing or not. Um, it just protects you if you're wrong. Yeah, I think I think that is accurate. I, well, I know it's accurate since I'm just being more blunt this time. It is totally accurate. Um, and I do that some, and maybe I shouldn't. I do that some. And, and you go on, and again, I appreciate your comments. You go on, you say, in, you know, in the Bible, God wasn't cryptic. He, he doesn't change. If God were to speak with you, it wouldn't be a maybe he is. I, again, I totally agree with your comments here and the rest of it. We don't want to just slap my desire. We don't want to just slap God's blessing on my desire and pretend that it's actually blessed of God. 100% agree with you. And I think that is what it amounts to most of the time. And I think, and I don't remember if I covered it in the video or not. I think people just wrestle with, you know, how much of being led by the spirit, how confident can I be that something is the Holy Spirit leading me versus, uh, you know, the random thoughts of my mind. And I think that's what people wrestle with. And I think that's why they get stuck in this sort of a logical trap, if you will. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree with you. If God was speaking in the sense of like the Old Testament, he would literally speak or there'd be burning fiery bush. Um, then yeah, there's zero doubt or ambiguity to that. I think it's, I think most people just struggle with how do I know whether this is the Holy Spirit or not? And I've done videos on how to, uh, biblical decision making. I should probably do another one or two. Um, so yeah, I think that might be helpful to redo that one or, or just to reference back to that one. But I think that's what people are getting at. But I think that you are completely correct that if, if we're claiming God on something, it needs to be ironclad and clear and otherwise 
you know, hey, just be honest. I, I'm not sure here. I want to do this and I'm praying about it and so on. So anyway, um, I could do, I, I'm, I'm trying not to just delve into an entire second video on that, but thank you very much. I, I love your comments and I agree with you. The next one is another troll, very obviously. This one was about two months ago on a video, subscriber Q&A, take the Lord's name in vain. And uh, T-Bone, um, says, I'd like to pose a question for the big man. Uh, do you believe everything written in the Bible to be true? Think carefully before you answer. Good luck. Wow, the arrogance is just dripping off the text. Um, all right, so first off, you know, the whole big man thing. Really? Are you, are you, you're having to start off with an ad hominem making fun of me? I mean, I'm fat, I'll admit it. I've said it in many, many of my videos, and yeah, I need to work on that. Um, but that's, yeah, it just proves you have no genuineness in anything that you're asking when you start off that way. Uh, unless you're talking about God, in which case you wouldn't be, you know, if you're saying, Hey, the big man, um, but you wouldn't be asking me that question if that's what you meant. So anyway, that insults aside, um, do you believe everything written in the Bible to be true? Think carefully before you answer. First off, this is called a leading question because you think you're leading me into a trap uh, because you already know the answer to that. I've made that very clear in all of my videos. Plus, it's a fundamental uh, belief for any Protestant Christian group, um, which is why some groups that claim to be Protestant aren't because they question whether the Bible is true or not. Um, so, uh, yeah, good luck to you too, buddy. Um, yeah, of course I believe the Bible is true. All right, the next video is Basics, Becoming a Black Belt Christian. And the comments were about a month ago, and there are actually several comments on this one. And, and I appreciate the interaction, guys. I really do. And again, I hate that it took me so long to get back to you guys. Um, but anyway, I, the, the first one, uh, Chris uh, Kilmartin, um, I, I think you're asking an honest question here. I don't, I don't read this as a troll at all. So I think you're honestly asking a question. Possibly you already have your mind formed on what you think and you're pointing out what you believe to be a contradiction on my part, or you're just sincerely asking, is this a problem? Either way, I take your comments to be sincere and I thank you for that. I love hard questions uh, when somebody's being sincere. So anyway, uh, Chris Kil Kilmartin um, asked, I am wondering about how you can be a black belt and a Christian. Uh, let me first off say I've had this question a lot over the years. This is a fair and valid question. So again, thank you. And then you ask again a valid question based on what I what your understanding is clearly from the next part. Uh, how can you serve two masters? What about the Eastern religion? I think it is problematic. So again, I've I've heard this question many times over the years. You can see over my shoulder, sort of. Uh, you can see one of my black belts there. Um, that's uh, my main black belt actually back there. Um, so again, that's a totally fair question. I've, I've, I wrestled with this before I started karate. I wrestled with it a few times while I was in karate. And then of course, ever since then, I have uh, answered these types of questions uh, many, many times, especially as a pastor um, and a martial artist. So you're not alone in wondering about this. And, and I think that there is a, a, an assumption that you're admitting here um, that, that kind of forces it in, in one of two directions. So the question is, how can you serve two masters? That's the question you're posing here. And that's a fair question. The simple answer is you can't. That's what Jesus actually uh, dealt with in Matthew chapter six, I believe it was. Um, you can't serve two masters. So you are correct that you cannot claim to be a Christian and be tied to or serving another religion. And therefore you ask the question, what about Eastern or the Eastern religion? I think it is problematic. So if by participating in the martial arts, I was serving or participating in Eastern religion, I would agree with you completely that it would be not only problematic because you're trying, I think you're trying to be gentle here. I think you're trying to be gracious and gentle. Yeah, not only would it be problematic, but I'll say it, it would be flat out idolatry and uh, an affront to God to participate in that Eastern religion. Um, so yeah, 
I agree with you. However, that is assuming, and so the underlying assumption that I was talking about earlier, that is assuming that in order to participate in the martial arts, you must participate in Eastern religion or uh, be a part of Eastern religion in order to do so. And um, uh, Christopher Gardiner uh, responded to you, uh, you know, do you believe the martial arts and Eastern religion cannot be separated? Which that's basically where I'm at in the logical flow of conversation is that I, I think it's obvious. And again, I want to be gracious, but I think it's obvious that you see those things tied together. So Christopher Gardner, thank you for asking that question. You are spot on. That's kind of the first question to ask. Um, and then also I'm going to go to uh, Varsha Rose. I think Varsha, you know, again, I really appreciate, and you're a martial artist, so you've clearly had to deal with this question before. So uh, Chris Kilmartin, I'll get back to you, but I want to read these first and then kind of summarize. Um, but Varsha Rose, I, from what I remember, it was uh, a week or two ago when I read your comment, and I'm just now kind of getting back to it. And Varsha, I thank you very much for your comments. I think you're basically getting to what I am going to end up saying. So thank you for giving a, a very solid response there. Uh, uh, and all three of you, again, these are the kind of comments that I love because we're asking honest questions, we're being respectful, and that is so rare <laughs> in social media. So thank you to all three of you. But yeah, Varsha Rose uh, says, you know, I think he's not specifically referring to being a black belt but being a black belt Christian in parentheses, uh, that means to become a black belt, you need to know the basics, be disciplined, consistent, and many more things. Uh, in the same manner, he wants to convey the message of becoming a black belt Christian by knowing the basics of the Bible, being disciplined, obedient to the Almighty Father, being consistent in prayers. 100%. I was using being a black belt in, in real life, an actual martial art black belt, as an analogy. I don't think that's lost on Chris Kilmartin. I, I think, I, I'm assuming that Chris understood that and was moving past it to questioning, hey, you're, you're a Christian, you're a teacher, you're a pastor, how can you participate in Eastern religion? I'm, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt and assume that that is what Chris Kilmartin was getting at. But again, uh, Varsha, I think you're nailing it, and I appreciate that response because maybe Chris isn't saying that. Maybe I'm assuming falsely on his part. And for the sake of a full discussion, it's very important to point out that from a logical standpoint, I was using being black belt as an analogy that we have to have the basics in order to get to the advanced stuff. Um, and then Varsha Rose, uh, hey, uh, high five for a fellow martial artist or board break, whatever you want to say. I don't know if your system does that or not. One of the systems that I do, boards don't hit back. There's no use in board breaking. And the other one, you know, they just love smashing stuff. So, uh, yeah. But high five or board break, whatever you want to say, for 11 years in the martial arts. Um, so you go on, and I myself, being a martial artist for 11 years, can assure you that we don't serve any masters or worship them. We have teachers whom we call sensei and even respect them. So obviously you're coming from a Japanese tradition of some sort. Um, even before training, I make sure to pray and ask the Lord to give me strength, courage, and knowledge. And I, I do the same. Uh, I always say a prayer and... Um, so let me kind of unpack a couple of these things, um, you know, because when you say we don't serve any masters, someone else and, and possibly Chris or anyone else might say, well, then why do you have the, ter the title master in there? How can you have the title of master when Jesus explicitly says, don't have masters? Matthew 23, 10, uh, this is King James. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. And in context, in verse 9, it says, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father who is in heaven. Um, so there's, there's a whole teaching there that I'm not going to take the time to unpack, but I've known a lot of Christians that say, well, even if you can do martial arts, the title of master is wrong because Jesus explicitly says, don't use the title master. Okay, if we're going to interpret that passage that way, then we're also forbidden from calling anyone father and a number of other things throughout the scriptures. If you're going to be consistent in that and that is your conviction, more power to you. 
And Chris, I'm not putting words in your mouth, so to speak, and saying you're making that argument. That's a logical outflow of this whole discussion. And again, thank you guys for the discussion component of this. Um, so I don't have a problem with a title master, as long as you understand that it's a title of respect, like Sensei, as uh, Varsha says, because we have the same titles all throughout society. So either the Bible intends us to be exceedingly literal and all titles are gone, or it's about the heart issue and are you calling this person a master in that I'm going to pattern my life after you and worship you? Well, there's only one who's worthy of worship. I believe that's what that passage means that we referenced a moment ago. But those are your two options. And again, I, I know this isn't what Chris is asking at all, whether, he, whether Chris might ask this, who knows. But that's not what he's asking, or I assume he... Um, Chris can go uh, either way, so to speak. Um, but that's not what Chris is asking. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I have a master's degree. Technically, anyone with a master's degree is a master of whatever their subject matter is. That is their official title. Um, so if someone was convicted that it's wrong to have those titles, then they should not ever have a master's degree or a doctorate. I don't feel convicted that way at all. I believe the context uh, is more what I said a minute ago about what is your heart attitude? Are you placing this person in an idolatrous position or is this a title of respect because that's what society agreed on and it's just a word? Again, you, you, you kind of have to choose one of those two directions with that title of master. But again, since that came up, I wanted to address that one. But yeah, anyway, the bottom line, kind of going back to Chris's comments and then kind of summarizing the whole discussion. Um, I believe, I'm confident, otherwise I would not be participating. I don't think that there is a necessary connection between the religious side of martial arts and the Eastern religion. Now, there's no doubt that many of the disciplines of martial arts found their origins in Eastern martial arts, and there's zero doubt that a number of those Eastern martial arts were founded, they were never founded on religious principles. Some people make that mistake. Uh, they were never founded on religious principles. It's that a way of defending themselves came out of a religious framework that we do not agree with and that the Bible explicitly says is not okay. So again, the two masters thing, you can't have it both ways. So the, the, the martial arts, in, if you're talking about Eastern martial arts, because obviously you have martial arts coming from all areas of the world, um, but the, and, and that's another thing is there's an inherent assumption in, in um, Chris, in the question that you're asking, there's an inherent assumption that it's an Eastern martial art. And, and I get it. Uh, if you're not a martial artist, which I, I'm taking it you're not, um, if you're not a martial artist, you, you may not even realize that. But there's martial arts from all over the world. There's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, for example. Um, that's not an Eastern religious martial art um, or, or an Eastern martial art. But anyway, um, there's martial arts from all over the world, bottom line. But let's, let's go with the Eastern one. Just because it came out of that framework does not mean it's tied to that religious uh, practice. Now, I will say you have to be more careful if someone is looking to do martial arts. You do need to be careful to know which of two possible directions is this martial art instructor and system coming from. One section of martial arts does tie the religious to their practice. One side does not. And I'm not saying it's like a 50-50 split by any means. I'm just saying out of the two possibilities. So if one required me to observe religious practices as part of learning the martial arts, absolutely, I would not do it. That would be contrary to scripture. I, I would be anathema in my... Um, in my practice, I, I can't serve two masters. I will not participate in the religious worship of a false god, gods, religion, whatever, fill in the blank. Uh, but the other half of the two possibilities is a group that says, well, I mean, yes, this was based in Eastern religion, so I don't know, maybe we have a dragon or something like that. Uh, well, first off, who said that a dragon is incompatible with the Christian faith? But well, that's a whole nother story. Um, uh, but, you know, maybe we have some of the art or something like that. 
but the practice is what I would call scientific in nature, right? We might call something a horse stance because that's what everybody knows it from. Well, in that case, it's just because it looks like you're riding a horse without the horse, right? You may um, talk about, for example, uh, in one of the two systems that I do, the word chi comes up occasionally. Um, in the way that people mean that word chi, I don't agree with it at all. It's contrary to scripture. It is anathema. It is, it is not okay according to scripture. So if somebody's talking about harnessing the universal energy of the world and letting the energy of whatever flow and all of that, I don't get into that at all. I don't believe it. Um, at the same time, if you approach it from a scientific standpoint and you understand what they're doing, you're talking about electrical signals firing through your body. Well, that is energy. They just mean it in this mystic kind of like a Star Wars sense, you know, let the force be with you. Well, I don't agree with that and I would not participate in that. But if you're talking about electrical signals or loading up potential energy and then delivering kinetic energy, um, that's scientific and, and now granted science has its own issues in terms of how science has become religious in many ways too. Um, but that's just a fact of physical existence. So I don't have a problem with that if somebody's saying, hey, look, uh, turn your foot this way because it's going to allow you to have more power. I don't have a problem with that. And I, I don't know anyone that would if they if they didn't have a presupposition coming into it. Um, so in my practice over the years, the studios that do, I just don't go back to those studios if they're into the super mystic stuff. Most of the people that I've known, in fact, one of the systems that I'm in right now, like I said, that comes up occasionally. And in, in that system, it's very much the individual instructor. But most of them don't even believe in the oneness, if you will. And that really comes from Buddhism, the, the universal oneness and all of that. It really comes from Buddhism is where that comes from. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. And frankly, most of them don't either. They've just been taught that that's how you explain it because Americans like all things Eastern for whatever reason. So anyway, I, there's an inherent assumption that the two have to go together, and that is a false assumption. But I think it's one that a lot of people have, and I don't blame someone for having that assumption. Now, whether that's true of Chris Kilpatrick or, or Chris Kilmartin, sorry, or not, I don't know. Um, but I wouldn't blame you if it was an assumption that you had, because a lot of martial arts, a lot of the public side of martial arts plays into that, because quite frankly, it sells. Um, but let me, let me present another one to you. And, and some people do feel this way. Uh, is it wrong for a Christian to celebrate Christmas? Because the Christmas holiday as we have it today is largely pagan, right? It is unlikely that December 25th was the actual birth date of Christ. There's a raging debate among people who care, uh, what day exactly it was. I'm not getting into that. And the whole trees and lights and all of that, those were borrowed from pagan religions. So can I not have a Christmas tree and put lights on it? And I'm not being sarcastic. I promise I'm not. I'm, I'm saying that it's the same thing, that sometimes you separate the origins and the practice because what it means to most people today, Christmas is an example, what it means to most, well, actually, what it means to most people today is it's a chance to get in debt, spend money we shouldn't, and have a lot of decorations and eat and drink way more than we should. That's what it means to most people today. But to most practicing Christians that celebrate Christmas, let me word it that way, we just like the tree because it's pretty and that's what we've done since childhood. And if that's all we're putting into it is, I like the pretty tree and it's my family's tradition, I don't see a problem with that anywhere in scripture. Now, if I start praying to the sun God or something as part of my practice of Christian uh, or of Christmas, then yeah, clearly we have a problem at that point. So I don't know if that helps or not, um, but the bottom line is that the martial arts in most places today is taught from a scientific uh, or, or physics perspective, not from a religious perspective. And, Again, even a lot of the ones that do incorporate some of the religious elements, if you will, most of them don't really believe that part of it either. So 
Um, you know, again to uh, Christopher Gardner and uh, Varsha, thank you guys so much for your comments, and I appreciate you. And please uh, continue giving um, that kind of uh, feedback. And Chris Kilmartin, thank you for that question. Um, I, I debated whether or not to address this subject ahead of time or not but I figure I have a tendency to go long on my videos anyway, so maybe I shouldn't. Um, so thank you for asking the question because I think it's an important one. Please let me know if this was an adequate explanation, if that helps. And if not, let me know and I'll follow up either in text or maybe another video. Um, but again, thank you so much for your comments and questions. Um, okay, so the next one is from Varsha Rose, I think. Yeah, uh, okay, boom, there we go. Okay, so the next one is from Varsha Rose. Uh, I didn't realize that when I was reading comments before. So that's two comments from you. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, you asked the question, do people still make altars to God in this generation in Exodus 20? And this is on the Walk Through the Bible, Exodus 20, 22 to 26 video. Um, so there's a couple of different directions that I can go. I, I have sort of a context for who you are through your comments in the previous video, um, but even just the statement by itself, I think I have enough to understand kind of where you're coming from in this question. There's two ways to go on this question. Do people still make altars to God in this generation? You could mean this in the literal physical sense of altars. Like, do people still physically make an altar and practice their religion at this physical altar, like a stone or wood or something like that. Or you may be asking the question more generically, like a spiritual altar or something like that, which then would slip into idolatry. And so technically both of those could and would lead to a form of idolatry. So let me approach this from three directions first. I know I said two just a second ago. Um, so the first thing is a lot of churches still use the term altar in terms of their building, you know, uh, the altar call as it's known in many um, Protestant denominations at the end of the service. And this really, this came from the great revivals. Billy Graham kind of made it famous, but it really came from the great revivals, the altar call. Uh, it was not a common practice prior to them for there to be an altar call. But in most, ch in most churches, the altar call is at the end of the service where the pas pastor or whoever the speaker is, is saying, okay, based on the message, I'm challenging you in this way, come forward if you need to respond. That's an altar call because originally in the Roman Catholic Church and other practice, they would have a literal altar at the front of the building and you were called to the altar that is, it is symbolism going back to the Old Testament in my Exodus series. Check out my Exodus series. Um, it's actually symbolism of people coming to the physical altar where they would sacrifice an animal, the literal altar in the Old Testament where they would sacrifice an animal. And sometimes they would hang on the horns of the altar or something like that. Um, so definitely not getting into all of that, but there's, there's a weird lineage of that term. I don't think that's what you mean. Maybe it is, and hopefully I, I've dealt with that if so, but I don't think that's what you're really asking there. Um, but yeah, some churches still use the term altar just to refer to the front of the church where there's some steps or maybe a kneeling bench or something like that, depending on the... Um, the, what's the word I'm looking for, the lineage of that particular denomination. That's not the word I'm looking for, but that communicates it. Um, so that said, if you're asking the question, do people make literal altars to this day? I would say in America, not really. I, I'm not aware, I mean, you do have some pagan religions and things like that that make literal altars. Uh, you have, for example, uh, Native American, many Native Americans, uh, they actually just make an altar wherever it is they're offering their offering. Um, you see uh, Wiccan religion and, and some other forms of pagan religions, they might set up a altar in the middle of the woods or wherever, or they might have them in their home. Um, so in that sense of like this public altar, it's not very common in America. Uh, it is common throughout the world, uh, South America, Africa, the East. Those types of altars are extremely common. Uh, if you, I've never been able to travel, but I've seen 
pictures, videos, testimonials. You know, if you ever travel to uh, China or Japan, for example, you'll have literal altars. And you're a martial artist, so I'm confident you know this. Um, I'm just saying this for the sake of the video. Um, you'll have literal altars, like incense altars and so on. And if you really want to get deep in the weeds, again, I'm confident you know this. Um, but your a dojo or a dojang in the traditional uh, would sort of be an altar. There would usually be an altar there. Um, so in that sense, yes, throughout the world, literal physical altars are still built. Now, are they built to the God of the Bible? I'm not familiar with any uh, groups that do that with the exception of the Roman Catholic Church but they don't offer offerings on it in the sense of the Old Testament. And then in particular, the, um, I don't know what the right term is, but in South America, there is a, a predominance of, and, and, and I mean this in love, I'm not trying to make fun of anyone, but there is a predominance of what I would call paganized Roman Catholic uh, in South America, where it's a, a blending of pagan religion and what they remember of Roman Catholic teaching. And so altars there to, in theory, to the God of the Bible are not uncommon. Um, now, I would say that those are not consistent with Scripture on multiple levels, um, but those are fairly common. I think, I don't know that this is what you were asking, but I think... Most people do build altars to God, but I think they become idols most of the time. If I'm, and again, if I'm not answering your question, please ask me. I did go back just a second ago because I wanted to go back and look at the specific passage that you were asking that question from. Um, and in that passage, uh, it's talking about if you're going to make an altar, here's how to make it. Don't make it to other gods, but make an altar of earth or stone, etc., for these various offerings. Um, so let me answer what I was going to say, and then I'll come back to deal with that in a second. I think people do make altars to God a lot, but I think they become paganized or become idols um, because unfortunately we are professional idol makers, whether we realize it or not. Um, so I think a lot of times people, maybe they start out well, like, you know, I want to have a picture of Jesus to remind me of, uh, I don't know, Jesus is always watching, whatever it is that, that makes you want to have that picture of what we think Jesus may possibly have looked like. Hint, he was not white. Um, but um, then it's really easy to start praying to the picture and forget that it's supposed to be a representation, which is why the Ten Commandments, one of the first was don't make any images. That, that was part. So that's an example that, of how that leads you astray without meaning to. Um, but I think also some people, their idol is their service, you know. Well, I, their altar at first, the place which they offer the sacrifice of their time, talent, treasure. But then it's easy for that sacrifice and that altar, if you will, in this more generic spiritual, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, allegorical sense of altar. It's very easy for that to become an idol. Well, I do everything and this church wouldn't survive without me and nobody else does what I do. Well, congratulations. Now it's an idol between, in between you and God, if that's what is going on. Um, and again, I'm not accusing you of that. It's just the generic you in response to this. So yeah, it's pretty common, I think, in this kind of allegorical altar sense. I don't think that's what you were asking, but I figured I'd go ahead and address it. But specifically from verses 22 to 26, the video that you asked the question in, um, you know, God is saying in verse 24, you shall make an altar of earth for me. Then in verse 25, if you make an altar of stone for me, you shall not build it out of cut stones and so on. Um, I would say that this is something that was clearly violated throughout the Old Testament. Now, whether that was that God allowed it later or whether the people just did it anyway, I think it's probably more that the people just did it anyway. Um, but in context, I don't think if, if maybe what you're asking is, are we supposed to? Um, no, 
Because the altars that are being made here are for the purpose of sacrificing animals within the religious framework of ancient Israel within the governmental nation of Israel. So there are several things removed. We're not part of the governmental nation of Israel that existed at that point and ceased to exist as a government. Again, the ethnic, as I've said in other videos, the ethnic Jewish crew is still alive and well, uh, in spite of history. Uh, all my Jewish friends, you can laugh at that one, um, but or identify with it or whatever. Um, but the, the government that existed at that time ceased to exist in either 722 or 586 ballpark uh, during the um, conquering of the, the actual nation of Israel in the, uh, in the country governmental sense and wasn't reinstituted for a while. Um, so anyway, um, so that ceased to exist, as did the religious practice. God giving the altar and sacrificial system was to teach us. You know, Paul says in Galatians 3 that the law, meaning the sacrificial system as well as the law itself, is a schoolmaster to teach us our need of Christ. Now that Christ is here, we don't have to sacrifice. There's no benefit to sacrificing animals and so on and so on, because Christ is our ultimate sacrifice. I, I've done videos on that. I could do a whole video just on that. Uh, again, I'll assume that you understand all of that. Um, so no, in the modern day, we don't need to have a literal altar in that sense. So I've spent a lot of time uh, answering questions that you may or may not have even been asking but I hope that helps, and please shoot back at me. I probably completely missed the point, um, so please shoot back at me and let me know your thoughts on that. All right, the next one is on two videos, actually, from the same person commenting. Uh, Emma Farrell, if I'm saying your name correctly. If not, please forgive me, but... You have no idea how encouraging, I could have just given a quick response to this one and several people that you gave me an encouragement and I did just give you a quick response. I wasn't trying to ignore you. Um, I'm trying to keep this video as short as possible and I'm already like way long in this video, but you commented on Genesis 21 and 27. Uh, this is beautiful and uh, love these videos. and. And I just want to say thank you so much to Emma for your encouragement and to all of you that give me encouragement. I have a few subscribers that are really, they just, they're consistent encouragers. You know, I have others that are just kind of random encouragements, but guys, you have no idea how much that encouragement means to me. Uh, you may think, oh, you know, I appreciate the video, but he's not going to read this. Well, <laughs> fair charge in terms of I may not get to it immediately, but I read every single comment and I read all of every single comment. Um, and it is really encouraging when people express their appreciation. You know, I, I think everybody struggles, especially on social media with, am I making a difference? Am I wasting my time? Um, you know, I've been doing this now, we're well over 600 videos and I've been doing this since 2019. And it is a labor of love and a legacy, as I referred to in last week's video. Um, but yeah, I do wonder sometimes, am I just wasting my time? Is this all for nothing? Am I making any impact whatsoever? Because, you know, but I mean, let's face it, you know, four years, a little over 600 subscribers in the world of YouTube and social media, that's nothing. Um, that, that, that's, that basically means you're not really reaching anyone. Now, that's not literally what it means because obviously people are interacting, watching, and so on. But as a, as a content creator or really what I am as a disciple or someone who loves to share and teach, um, it is discouraging to not see that growth. But welcome to life and ministry, right? Um, but anyway, my point is I struggle with that sometimes and I really appreciate your encouragement. So Emma, thank you very much for taking the time to encourage me and let me know. Um, you know, Sarah Chadwick on my Proverbs, uh, Walk Through the Bible, Proverbs 20, 16 to 21. You know, you are also giving me encouragement. And in your case, you're giving me specific encouragement by saying you didn't understand six, verse 16 until now. 
again, any encouragement is appreciated. Most people hear the negative instead of the positive. That's just the way the world works. So that encouragement helps, but also letting me know specifically what helped. I mean, right now I kind of make videos like, ah, I think people might want to hear this. So I'll make a video on it, but I don't really have a lot of feedback on specifically what is helping people. Well, as a disciple or teacher, I, I want to help people where they need the help. So I really appreciate you uh, letting me know that. That is uh, very much appreciated. Um, top production on the Proverbs 6, 1 through 5. Same thing. God bless you and thank you for the encouragement. And I'm probably missing someone. I know I gave a couple of quick replies. So again, thank you to all of you that give me encouragement. It really does mean a lot. It really does when I log in and check comments and I see that people are interacting and appreciative or people that have genuine questions, that encourages me and that's what kind of fuels me to keep going beyond just the drive to ultimately to please God and also to hopefully leave a legacy because there will come a day, whether sooner or later, there will come a day where I will not exist on this earth and if Christ has not returned, whatever that looks like, um, then I won't be here and others will. And I hope to still make an impact for the kingdom of God at that point. All right. So for the next one of uh, is for Johnson Bob 720 dealing with the subject of karma on my video karma. Can you be a Christian? Um, I actually recorded a video response to all of the comments in a separate video and as I started thinking about it and as I was praying, I just felt led to take that video down. It Technically it went live for like an hour or two, but I just, I wanted to make sure that later on when I'm dealing with the troll, that I'm doing so in a way that is honest, blunt, but also honoring to Christ. And so I ended up taking that video down but uh, in that video, I did give a response to uh, Johnson Bob, and I don't think, I think that I did a decent job responding in that video. So we're gonna cut in just a second to that response, but I'll be in a different shirt because I was recording on a different day, so don't let that throw you. And thanks to the magic of editing, with a snap of my fingers, we'll be in that video. Okay, the next one is on a video, and I knew this would be a uh, controversial video, um, but a video that I titled, Karma, Can You Be a Christian and Believe in Karma? Um, and again, as I said before, it's been quite a while since I've recorded that video, much less listened to it to remember exactly what I did or didn't address in that video. Um, but Johnson Bob 720 commented, you know, Christians believe in karma as a matter of course. I agree with you. The argument that I know I was making in that video is that they shouldn't. Um, and then you go on to say karma is mentioned many times in the Bible. And I'm, I'm going to put a hard stop there respectfully. I'm going to put a hard stop on that. Karma is not mentioned in the Bible. In fact, I'm, I don't remember exactly what I did or didn't address in the video now, but, uh, that's a problem because a lot of people think that it is. They see what the Bible calls God's justice, that people cannot escape forever when they're sinning or doing bad things, that God in his justice will deal with them. The problem is that karma as a word, as an idea, actually comes from Eastern religious ideas, and it is opposed to scripture. Karma is impersonal. It is a, a balancing of right and wrong and the energy as divorce and, and the energy of the universe as divorced from a personal God. That, that's the very definition of karma. And that opposes scripture, that actually contradicts scripture and stands in opposition to God. So respectfully and in love, karma is not mentioned many times in the Bible. We see examples of people getting their just desserts, as we would put it in American as an American, that's a lot of times a way that we might say it. They get justice, they get what they deserve, right? Yeah, we see that tons in the Bible. And tons of time in the Bible, in Proverbs and elsewhere, we see warnings, you know, I'm going to paraphrase, you know, don't be an idiot, quit being mean to people or you're going to get yours. Yeah, we see that tons in the Bible, but that's not karma. 
That is the result of a personal God talking about judgment, talking about justice, and reminding us that we can't just get away with things and think that we're good, that he will judge us. In fact, um, later in your comment... um, you, you mentioned Christians can pray, believe in the Lord, forgive their sins. Absolutely. Um, and, and free themselves from the law of cause and effect. Uh, depends on how you mean that. I actually did a video. Um, give me a second to think of the name. I did a video, I'm gonna point, I think I have enough cards left. Um, It's something to the effect of, um, are Christians free from consequences or like natural natural consequences versus something else? We'll we'll put a link in the, either the description or in the card there, uh, where I actually address that while God does forgive us the ultimate consequences, as in being separated in hell from him for eternity, yeah, absolutely, he forgives us, a Christian can pray and be relieved of those. But God does not always, and I would even argue often, does not spare us the natural consequences of our bad or evil behavior. So, you know, you commit murder, a justified defense is not, well, I'm a Christian and I ask God to forgive me, therefore I shouldn't go to jail. No, you should. That's the natural consequence. And my guess is that's not how you meant your comment here. I'm guessing you meant this in the eternal sense, Um, but I'm just trying to be careful and make sure that I am uh, being specific. Um, So anyway, yeah, a hard stop on karma being mentioned in the Bible. I already explained that. Um, But yes, totally, 100%, we are in agreement that ultimately, in in your last comment there, this is because the Lord Jesus used his precious blood and his body to cover our sins, totally, absolutely, 100%. I I think part of the problem is that the phrasing karma has become so common in American culture And unfortunately, the church, instead of influencing culture, the church in America has been influenced by culture. Instead of the church acting upon culture, it's allowed culture to act upon the church. And because of that, the language of karma has seeped its way into church language. And that is unfortunate because, again, it stands in direct opposition to God. Karma is an impersonal balancing of right and wrong. It's, it's, it's specifically not connected to any personal being or God. It is a universal law out there in the energy of the universe. Those are Far Eastern uh, philosophies that contradict and, and are opposed to the scriptures. And unfortunately, that is very, very, very common to hear that in the modern church. I'm, you know, just over 40 years old, and I look back to what I would call old shows, like I Dream of Genie. You know, I like that show. Uh, Some of you will think it's cheesy. Some of you will be horrified that I watched it. Um, But even then... Okay, I hope that was helpful. Welcome back from the blue shirt video back to the gray shirt video. Um, So this one, the next one is uh, Danielle... Danielle Orts, I think, or Daniel Orts. I think it's Daniel Orts. Sorry, it's a little hard to see on my screen, but I think it's Daniel Orts. And this is on the video, Walk Through the Bible, Exodus 32, 15 to 35. Um, You say, this video starts off by saying to watch the previous video that was discussed by clicking the link. The link does not take you to the correct video. Also, I can't find the video searching the website or YouTube. Thanks. Uh, Daniel rock on, man. Thank you so much for pointing that out. I cannot fix it if I don't know it's broken. So first off, thank you for watching um, and and being part of our little family here on YouTube. Um, Thank you so much. I will check into this as soon as I am done with this video today or tomorrow. I will check into this and see where that video is. If I can't find it, I will have to re-record that video um, because it's possible somewhere between me and editing and all of that, it's possible that it got taken down or deleted or maybe we never uploaded it. It's also possible that I thought I recorded it and didn't. I I doubt that happened because I usually keep pretty detailed records, but uh, yeah, I will figure out what's going on and I will let you know. I'm gonna give you a response to your comment 
as soon as this video goes live. And if I need to re-record that video, then I will do so and let you know that as well. Thank you so much. All right, next up is uh, informal greeting on the video basics becoming a black belt Christian. So this is another thread on that video. Um, and unfortunately you, well, fortunately and unfortunately, unfortunately you are sandwiched uh, with our troll there on that video, but thank you for stating the obvious and for, uh, you know, sticking up for us or sticking up for the Bible or whatever your motive was. Uh, bravo, high five. Uh, thank you very much for your response because as I said in my most recent uh, update video, I've had a lot going on and, uh, you know, it's, it's good when someone is uh, spreading nonsense for others to call them out on it in a loving and appropriate way, and you did. Um, so thank you so much to Informal Greeting for uh, your response. Um, so the question from the troll was, when did God ask you to regard the Bible as his word to you? Man, I've written papers on this. There are books on it. And the truth is the uh, person that wrote that question... <laughs> The truth is you already know the answer to that as evidenced by many other comments, but it was good for informal greeting. It was good for you to call that out because I said it in the videos. You, you literally go, whenever he first read Mark 7, 13 is a good guess. Like, hello, Captain Obvious here, right? Um, so, you know, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, informal greeting, you rock. I appreciate you very much keep defending the faith and pointing out silliness or whatever your motivation was. All right, now to deal with the elephant or uh, troll in the room. Um, I'm gonna be, try to be careful in this response because I don't wanna give more attention than is warranted. At the same time, um, there is a user that has the word Viking in their name, I'm gonna leave it at that, that uh, has taken advantage of the fact that I have a life and I've had a lot of stuff going on. I did respond in depth to one of this person's comments and said, look, here's this, here's a quick rundown of where you're going wrong on this comment. I've got things going on in life that I don't have time to respond and I will respond when I have time. This was in the beginning when this person first showed up and I thought, okay, this is a passionate, aggressive person. I don't mind that. They're asking questions that are valid questions at that point, although starting with an ad hominem attack, um, but that's not unusual. So that was like, eh, okay, I'll still respond. Um, but I told you guys in one of my very first videos, uh, I'll point to it there. I believe it was my hello world video. Um, I'm not going to mess around with someone that's honestly, that's actually literally trolling. Ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, and there's no way to win against a troll because their logic is whatever's convenient to them at the moment. They're not actually using reasoned argument and logic. They're just doing the two-year-old thing or the five-year-old thing and, you know, rules change as I go because I can't handle the truth. So I wanted to give a measured response and one that honors the Lord, but also deals with this directly. So I'm going to read my response and that's it. I will be doing a video in a few moments after I record this. Um, it hasn't been necessary until now, um, but it's okay. I'm gonna do a video that, you know, congratulations, you're a troll. And that way from now on when I'm dealing with somebody that is obviously a troll, I can just play that same video instead of wasting my time and everyone else's time because everybody else reading comments has to read through that nonsense. Um, so anyway, uh, I'll just read to you my response. I'm sure this will not be acceptable, but nothing is going to be acceptable to this individual. So just to deal with Viking really quick, because honestly, the comments you've made are not worthy of spending any real time. You are an obvious troll. Uh, the very first thing you do is start off with an ad hominem attack and flat out admit whether you intended to or not that you're making emotional arguments rather than logical ones. Then everything you say across all your comments, and we're up to at least seven in a month now, six or seven comments minimum in one month's time when I've already said I have a lot going on. Let me stick to the script. 
Uh, then everything you say across all your comments contradict each other. For example, at one point you say there are 66 books in the Bible, but then elsewhere you start quoting Enoch as if it's one of the scriptures within the Bible. In one place you claim that the Lagos that you believe in is the Stoic version or essentially the Stoic version, but then in the next sentence you tie Lagos to Jesus. You can't do that because the original understanding of Lagos was an impersonal concept and tying it to Jesus is both personal and and specific, which is exactly what made the opening of John so powerful. All the readers of John would have been nodding, yeah, Logos in the beginning, stoic, separate. And then John made it personal and they'd have been like, hold up now, right? Um, so yeah, that's exactly what made John's opening so powerful. Then your whole entire argument centers around the scriptures not being God's word, and yet you try to lambast me with the Isaiah passage saying that I'm going to be judged of God based on the passage of Isaiah. Whoosh, you missed it, as they say on Reddit. In my opinion, that's the very definition of an internet troll. Someone who is simply seeking attention, thinks themselves an expert while demonstrating a complete failure to grasp the subject matter, and then whines when they don't get the attention they desire. You seem to think that peppering comments in every video possible somehow makes you correct, and in particular, you routinely make comments to the effect of, since you haven't responded, it proves I'm right and you're just scared to answer. As the meme says, you truly have a dizzying intellect. But if at some point you decide to ask real questions and have real dialogue, I'll re-engage. In the meantime, I don't have time for trolls. I have time for skeptics who want honest discussion. And that is not you based on the comments you have made so far. Okay guys, that's it for today. If you appreciate this, hey, let me know in the comments. Is this a good format when I get really backed up and I just can't keep up with everything? Uh, like I said in my most recent update for the next year, uh, I'm gonna be pretty busy. Um, so let me know in the comments, is this a good format? If I can't get to you, do you like this? I would love to do live videos at some point so that we can actually dialogue back and forth. For example, Varsha Rose, her, her question or comment on the Exodus 20. I feel like I'm totally missing what you were asking there, so I spent forever trying to give you an answer, hoping I stumbled across it. I, I, I'm just missing it, I'm sure, so whoosh to me on that one. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, let me know if you appreciate this, this format when, when I have the ability. I'd love to do live at some point. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's it for today, guys. Thank you very much, and God bless.